Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Amen. It's good to see everyone this morning. If you follow the, if you follow the portions, you know that our portion for this Shabbat reveals sin in the camp. Imagine that. I guess where you have people, you have sin. Amen? Amen. Yes. How quickly God's people went from the bondage of slavery in Egypt to the bondage of adultery. Didn't take long, did it? Our passage this morning comes on the heels of over ten chapters of laws, regulations, instructions in the Torah. <coughs> Excuse me. And after B'nai Israel came to Mount Sinai, they heard a proposal from God, not unlike some of you men have made. <laughs> a proposal. God said, you saw what I did to the Egyptians and how I saved you from slavery. Now, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be my <coughs> my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, everything belongs to me. I will read that again. Everything belongs to me. Amen. But you will be for me a priestly kingdom, a holy nation set aside from the rest. Now, all of the text makes it sound like this was a new covenant. It was really a rehearsal of the covenant that God had already made with Abraham and Sarah. But that's what God also did with Yitzhak and Yaakov. Every new generation was given the same promise. How quickly, <coughs> brothers and sisters, we forget. God's promises, which are why his people always needed and continue to this day need reminders. The unique thing here in Shemot or Exodus is that God finally clarified what Israel's part of the covenant looks like. God explained to Moshe what kind of life the people should live. B'nai Israel gathered at Mount Sinai, agreed to the mitzvot or the command spoken to Moshe. And so we read from Exodus 19.8, all the people answered as one. Everything Adonai has said, we will do. There it is. I do. <laughs> do you take this, I, I, this man, this woman, to be your wife, husband? Are you practicing those, Carol? Practice those. I, I do. I do. Moshe reported the words of the people to Adonai. Covenant was complete. The offer was made. The offer was accepted and agreed to. God has made his promise to the people, and the people have signed unto their end of the covenant to obey all of God's commandments. And there you have it. And this included the Yetzirah Hadavarim, the Ten Words and the Ten Matters, better known as the Ten Commandments. Jaden, if you were here for his bar mitzvah two weeks ago, that's what he spoke on. Are the Ten Commandments still relevant today? He made a great drosh for his bar mitzvah. Right. And these are the instructions regarding worship. Instructions regarding the Mishkan or the tabernacle. Instructions regarding sacrifices that they were to bring to the temple or to the Mishkan. And, and uh, certainly how to observe and obey the holy days. But also there were rules about economics. Welcoming the stranger into the land and what to do in situations if there's violent conflict. The covenant, therefore, was conditional. If they would obey God's voice, if they would keep the covenant, then they would be God's chosen people. Obedience, as young Jaden said two weeks ago, obey, obey, obey. Obedience was part of the package. And this is true all along, even before God gave us Torah. When God called Abraham, the blessing was offered on the condition that Abraham and Sarah leave their homeland and join God on a journey to a promised place, a promised land. And when the people of Israel had arrived at Mount Sinai, they had just received the freebie. They were graciously saved from slavery in Egypt with no strings attached. No strings. And that's not, it's not that God demanded obedience for saving them. But now that they were free of their chains, God offered them the opportunity to continue on with the covenant made with Abraham. If you will obey me, my covenant, keep my covenant, then you'll continue being this holy nation of mine. 
But here's the obvious question, since we opened our draw saying that uh, sin is in the camp. Right? What happens if people don't obey? What? They just said they would. Are you kidding me? What if the people refuse to be holy? What? What if they refuse to set themselves aside for God's purpose? What then? What do we do? <clears throat> well, Shea was called back up to the mountain to seal the deal, and that's when the people lost their patience. They had a little antsy. Where's Moses? And the same people had just agreed to this covenant in the required manner of life and practice, including the prohibition against idol making and idol worship. These people asked our own to do what? <laughs> to make them an idol. This is the same group of people who had been passed over as the Egyptians lost all their firstborn. This is the same group that just beforehand signed unto the covenant and pledged their obedience to God. This people now ask Aharon to make them an idol to worship God with. We are so pitiful. What were they thinking? They weren't. They weren't. You're right, sister. They weren't thinking. And what do you think will happen when we cling to our idols? Because we all have them. You know what an idol is, don't you? It's the one thing that you hold on to more than God. It's one thing that God asks you to give up and you don't. Choose me or that. Whatever that is. It's the one thing. It's the one thing God takes you to on a daily basis in your walk with Him. Do you love this more than me? Right from the beginning, God made things abundantly clear to Abraham and Sarah and their descendants. If you obey, you will be my chosen people. Obedience was part of the package. But what, again, what if they refused to obey? What happened when Adam and Chama refused to obey? Remember that? One scholar I read suggested that this situation with the golden calf could be viewed as another version of the fall. In Rashid. In the early chapters of Genesis of Rashid, we read about God placing Adam and Chama into the garden and telling them to do what? To, to till it, to keep it, to maintain it, Right? In Shemot, God led the people into the wilderness and gave them instructions as well. Did he not? Sure he did. And just as Adam and Chava disobeyed God and were punished by being sent out of the garden, here in Shemot, the people disobeyed God again. So what will be their punishment? What will be their punishment? Did they think they'd get away with breaking their Tzarech of the Vreen? The Ten Commandments, while the ink was still wet? <laughs> Let's just stop for a moment and take some time to think about what exactly Israel did that was wrong. What did they do that was wrong? They made an idol of a gold, you know, of a gold calf. Sure, but what was that idol representing? <clears throat> did Israel intend to start worshiping a different god? A lot of people think that's a false god. Did they intend to worship a different God all of a sudden? Well, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure. When Aharon gathered up all the gold and made the idol, what did he say? What did he say? Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. <clears throat> Funny. The golden calf then say we're going to celebrate the Lord. I believe they were going to worship Yahweh, the God of Abraham. They just plan on using a golden calf to center their worship on. Is it any different today? Do we not put idols up that we worshiped before? That's one of the dangers of having a Torah scroll. Many people don't see beyond the Torah to the Messiah of the Torah. Many people don't see beyond the cross to see in Christianity to see the Messiah. Many people don't see beyond the building to see the saving grace of God. So much of our faith is riddled with idols of tradition and practices that we embrace vehemently and we don't see the Messiah in them. <clears throat> like my conversation yesterday with the with pastor up the road. So I'm going to make something clear to you. I said, Star East is not about trying to out-Judaize every other Messianic congregation. We're not about that. So if you have that expectation with us, man, it's not what we're about. We're about trying to find Messiah in everything that we do and say. 
And if we don't find Messiah in it, then we make some compromises. Some, we make some changes. It's all about Yeshua and nothing more, nothing less. And that's what it is for us. He says, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. See, why would they suddenly need an idol to worship the God whom they have been following out of Egypt? Why would they need that? Why not just worship God in the Spirit? They turn to the idol because there's another form of idolatry that the people of Israel have become guilty of. A little more subtle. We do it today. They've been worshiping Moshe. They've been worshiping Moshe. Because we do the same thing here. We get people in our lives and we're all gaga about them. And we lift them up as if they are a god themselves. We're so enamored by certain individuals. They're gifting, they're calling, they're anointing. That we, they're, it's all about them. We don't see the God through them, we just see them. They get in the way. That's the same thing that happened with the people. It's all about Moshe. Moshe was their intercessor. Moshe was their mediator. Speaking to God on their behalf and bringing messages from God. And now when the people no longer have Moshe in front of them, what they do? They panicked. God's gone. At least they're God. The people needed some object, some physical object to stand in for God, whether it was Moshe or a gold calf. They wanted something to hang their faith on to. But rather than standing in faith and trusting Yahweh, who is spirit, the people are grasping for something or someone that can keep their focus and their attention and their faith hung on to. Without Moshe around, what did the people do? People went searching. They went searching for something to fill in the gap, right? Doesn't a lot of people do that when they break up with somebody? Yeah. Right? Don't they? They're so used to being in a relationship that it isn't about the person they were married to. It's about the relationship they were in. They want, it's more about having a relationship or a husband or wife than it is having that person. That's a big difference there. Rebound, I think we call it. They needed something because they're so used to having something there to focus on, and that was Moshe. Something easier to control, something easier to grasp hold of, something they could manage themselves. And I don't do the trick just right. And this is the same maneuver that Moshe tried when he asked God for his name. Moshe wanted to know God's name so he could explain God to the people. What was God's response? No. <laughs> it's what he said. Then he said, just tell the people, I am who I am. That's not you. I am who I am. That's good enough for you. I am who I am. And that's where we get the name yod Hey vav Hey, And we apply vowels to it. Some agree with the vowels we apply to it or not. We say Yahweh. Some have an issue with it. But nevertheless, it's yod Hey vav Hey, the four consonants. It's an anglicized version of the Hebrew letters that say, I am who I am. You can't wrap up God with a name. And I don't know why we're so busy about that. But God is beyond naming. As I said before, so many people are caught, caught up with the sacred name nonsense. Well, it doesn't say to say his name. He says, it says to know, know him. To know the name. To know God. To know him. Have relationship, intimacy with him. God will be who God will be. And this addresses one of the most common temptations for Christian theologians. There's always a temptation to use language to place God into a box of de de definitions and teachings. And the people weren't trying to start a new religion, worshiping a foreign idol. They were trying to bring this incredible God into a more manageable space that they could handle. And really, if we're being honest, really control. Control. Because we don't obey God we really have God obey us if we really are honest, dead honest. As much as we try to obey God, we're really trying to get God to kind of acquiesce to us, to roll with it with us. More manageable space. Not way off on the mountaintop, not this ethereal God out of nowhere, but rather close, intimate. I can hold you. Here's my little God. 
They wanted that. And this happens regularly among us, even if we don't melt down our gold rings into a national idol. Think about what ways we do to try to put handles on God so that we can get him to do our will. How do we try to tame God? Which boxes do we try to place God in? Is there a Moshe-like figure in your life, maybe? Maybe you ought to be, think about that. Is there a Moshe-like figure in my life? Somebody that we live our faith vicariously through, right? There's a lot of married couples out there. You have, you have one, one of the couples, and you're supposed to stay married to them. If you're faithful to the Lord, stay married to them. Yeah, it's good, right? But many times, as I shared two weeks ago, Many times people will live their lives, by, their faith walk vicariously through somebody else. Your grandma is a godly woman. So you hang around grandma a lot. You don't have your own relationship with the Lord, but grandma does. So if I hang around grandma, then I'm kind of around the Lord. Right? You know that happens. My friend, my friend has, has a religion. My friend knows God. So you, you always have that godly friend. Because you, know, you feel good about yourself because you have that godly friend. You got the bad friend, and you got the good friend. Right? So you feel like if you hang with this person, then, you, then God will like you better because you're around the godly person. Someone, it's that someone you've allowed to sit in as an intermediary between you and God. How, have you ever heard this? Well, do me a favor and talk to God for me. Right? We don't, it's not much different when we say, pray for me. Well, why don't you pray yourself? Why don't you ask God yourself? Catholics have been doing that for years with Mary. Why do I need to talk to Mary? Why don't I just speak to Jesus or show him myself? What do you need Mary for? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just common sense. But we do that. Yeah, when you're, you know, you know, when you're at church, be sure you say a few words for me. Well, why don't you go to church and say your own words? <laughs> and what happens when that person's gone? Out of your life. Right. Israel couldn't handle Moshe's absence. And so they had Aharon build them this golden calf. They now had something that they could manage, something they could focus on. And why not? Why would God prohibit the people from building an idol of him? Why would he have a problem with that? Why not give human beings, as fleshly and earthly as we are, something tangible, something physical, fleshly, earthly, to focus our faith on? Why not? What is it about an idol that's such a problem? Well, you know, I see a lot of times in war movies, my notice this, is uh, when a soldier's going into battle, right? What does he often have on this person? What does he bring with him? What? Bible, yes. Something else. He's cross. Cross sometimes. Picture of his loved ones. Thank you, Serene. Exactly right. His girlfriend, his wife, his family, his kids. He brings a picture. Are they physically there because the picture's there? But if you want to remember them, we often will take a picture of them. I have pictures of my kids in my wall. It's like, oh, you guys have pictures of family with you all times, right? And just looking at the photo reminds us of that individual, how close we are to them. Why not the same for God? In Shemot 32, 7, from our portion today, let me read. Adonai says to Moshe, go down, hurry up. Your people, your, that's the best, you got to catch that. Used to be God's people, now it's your people. <laughs> yeah, I've washed my hands. Does that sound familiar? Huh? Yeah, I've washed my hands. God was washing his hands at that point. He's had enough of them. Go down and hurry. Your people whom he brought up from the land of Egypt have become corrupt. So quickly, the scripture says, verse 8, they have turned aside from the way I ordered them to follow. They have cast a metal statue of a calf, worshipped it, sacrificed to it, and said, Israel, here is your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. <clears throat> God lets Moshe know his plan to destroy everyone except him and basically start from scratch. So obviously he's a little offended by the idol. 
And Israel had already failed their end of the covenant agreement. They made an idol <coughs> to represent God. They were disobedient. And now they should, or would face God's consuming wrath. Now, the strangest part of the story for me, and I don't know about you, but when I read this portion, it just like, bam, leaps off the pages. If you read this portion, there's one, this verse leaps, I mean, it's one of those verses that just, like, you go, what? It's one of those moments in Scripture, right? This is the strangest part of the story that comes next. After God promises to destroy Israel for its disobedience, Moshe interrupted the upcoming slaughter. And so beginning in 32 verse 11, we read, But Moshe implored the Lord as God and said, Moshe, plead with Adonai as God. He said, Adonai, why must your anger blaze against your own people whom he brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say it was with evil intentions that he led them out to slaughter them in the hills and wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent. Don't bring such disaster on your people. It's a scene that reminds us of Abraham arguing with God over the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. You might remember that in Genesis verse 18, verses 23 and 25. I'll read it for you. <clears throat> Abraham approached and said, he was approaching God and said, Will you actually sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous along with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shouldn't the judge of all the earth do what is just? Fair question. Wouldn't you ask it? <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. It seems that when you befriend God, you also get to argue with him. <laughs> In fact, the name Israel means what? Because it's Jacob or Yaakov's old name switched to Israel. God gave the name Israel, which means what? To wrestle with God and prevail, to argue. Both Abraham and Moshe wrestled with God, arguing with them, with him, and they got their way. It seems. This God who doesn't want to be pinned down by a name or an idol and has no problem debating and arguing with us? Why would you destroy these people of Israel in the mountains? Think about what the Egyptians will say about it. And Moshe basically tells God that his reputation is on the line. If God slays his people, what will become of Yahweh's purpose then? Ooh. Moshe's argument works, it seems. And this is where theologians, especially those influenced by Greek philosophy, will scratch their heads going, what's up here? We're talking about God. After Moshe makes his plea, <clears throat> in verse 14, we read Adonai that changed his mind about the disaster he had planned for his people. Ve'yi nachem Yahweh. Michael Carlton just read that for you. Ve'yi nachem Yahweh. The Lord relented. The Lord changed his mind. Excuse me, the Lord changed his mind? Does that rattle you at all? Was he wrong? <laughs> How does that work? How does an all-powerful and all-knowing God ever change his mind? I mean, he's not a woman. <laughs> Just lighten up. Oh, I'm sorry. Today everybody's sensitive about everything. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not the box that we put God in. Or is it just that our all-knowing God condescends to our arguments because of his love for us? The text doesn't say. It just tells us that the guy who was going to consume the people in wrathful fury now changed his mind because of Moshe. And so in today's portion, we confront a theological doctrine. <clears throat> you ready for a little seminary training? The doctrine, the doctrine of immutability. The doctrine of immutability. Does anybody know what the doctrine of immutability is? Probably my wife does, because she reads Webster's. <laughs> you know what the doctrine of immutability is? Sure. No, I got her on that one. <laughs> the doctrine of immutability, the unchangeable nature of God. Yes. Linda knew she used to show off. 
This is what we're dealing with right here. And this is what appears in this verse to have changed. We, or so we think. Did God change his mind? The key word for us is nahal. It's now used here, but throughout the Tanakh, or the Old Testament, referring to men who have changed their minds. So it's not only a word that refers to God changing the mind, it's a word that's used for men and women changing their mind. Applying human activities to God is called what? Anthropomorphism. When you apply human traits... To God. Anthropomorphisms. That's what that is. The Bible is full of anthro anthropomorphism, anthropomorphisms. I'll give you an example. Like when God declares in Exodus 9, verse 15, By now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with such severe plagues that you would have been wiped off the earth. <laughs> but the problem with that is God is spirit. He ain't got no hand. God doesn't have a hand. He's spirit. That's an anthropomorphism. Well, there's at least ten other places in Scripture where it says that the Lord changed his mind. And how about how you would relate to his people? Backing off from a previous plan of action, there are numerous other places in the Tanakh where the word change, where the ha, is used to declare God never changes his mind. Wait a minute. Never changes his mind. Like in Numbers 13, or number 23. Numbers 23, verse 19. I'll read that to you if you don't have scripture. God is not a human who lies or a mortal who changes his mind. When well, here he changes his mind, and here he doesn't change his mind. When he says something, he will do it. When he makes a promise, he will fulfill it. Or how about 1 Samuel 15, 29? Moreover, the eternal one of Israel will not lie or change his mind. Because he isn't a mere human being subject to changing his mind. He says it twice in that verse. And yet our portion states that God changed his mind. Did he change his mind or not? Well, pastor, tell us. <laughs> well, I'm going to attempt to reconcile this paradox. I'm going to attempt to reconcile this paradox... And we're going to look at three truths from the Torah about the nature of God. Three truths about the nature of God. The first truth is God's perfections are unchanging. Unchanging God's perfections. God's attributes. Who he is. Who is God? He never changes. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. If you don't know what those words mean, you Google it. Hebrews 1, verses 10 to 11. In the beginning, Adonai, you laid the foundations of the earth. Heaven is the work of your hands. They will vanish, but you will remain. You remain the same. You remain the same. He's quoting Psalm 102. That's a quote of Psalm 102. And this is how the book of Hebrews begins and ends. If we go to chapter 13, verse 8, you know that verse. Yeshua the Messiah the same yesterday and forever. What does that tell you? He doesn't change. <clears throat> well, how about Malachi or Malachi, chapter 3, verse 6? But because I and I do not change, your sons of Yaakov will not be destroyed. God doesn't change, His nature does not change. His attributes, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, he's, he's uh, omnipotent, he doesn't change. That is a truth about God in Scripture. The second truth about God's nature is this. God's purposes are unchanging. God's purposes are unchanging. His perfections are unchanging and so are his purposes. Psalm 33, 10 to 11. Adonai brings to nothing the plans of nations. He foils the plans of the peoples. But the counsel of Adonai stands forever. Here it is. His heart's plans are for all generations. That takes into consideration observing Shabbat, observing High Holy Days, observing kosher. 
That's his heart. That's God's heart. That's for all generations. Well, for, that, that would include the generation that knows Messiah and on, right? Because all generations is what? All generations. Okay. All generations. God always does what he wants, and he always achieves what he wants. If you go to Yeshiahu or the prophet Isaiah, chapter 46, verses 9 to 10. <clears throat> Remember things that happened at the beginning long ago, that I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. At the beginning, I announce the end, <coughs> proclaim in advance things not yet done, and say that my plan will hold. I will do everything I please to do. That's God. So whatever he promises to do, his purposes and his perfections remain. But finally, there's a third truth. And the third truth is God's promises are unchanging. His purposes, his perfections, and his promises are unchanging. Isaiah 40 again, Yeshiahu, six verse, verses 6 to 8. A voice says, proclaim, and I answer, what shall I proclaim? All humanity is merely grass, all its kindness like wildflowers. <clears throat> the grass dries up, the flower fades, when a wind from out of night blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass dries up, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. The word of our God will stand forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of the Lord shall stand. We sing that song. Stand. And again, in Psalm, a little later, chapter 89, verses 34 to 37. I will not profane my covenant or change what my lips have spoken. I have sworn by my holiness once and for all. I will not lie to David or David. His dynasty will last forever. His throne like the sun before me. It will be established forever, like the moon, which remains a faithful witness in the sky. So what do we have? I just presented you three truths. Three truths of the unchanging nature of God's perfections, of God's purposes, of God's promises. And then we bring them into the context of our portion this morning, Shemot or Exodus 32, and we have to ask the question, is the Torah contradicting itself? Yeah. Well, you got to back that up, girl. <laughs> Truth is, this passage that causes so much debate as to whether God changes or not is dripping with the unchangeability of God. You just have to look for it. All these truths are saturated right there in chapter 32. Specifically in Moshe's prayer to God. We read from verse 11, chapter 32. Moshe pleaded with Adonai his God. He said, Adonai, why must your anger blaze against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a strong hand? That's God's mercy. I've redeemed you with a strong right hand. That's God's mercy. That's his grace. So Moshe is appealing to what? The perfection of God. He's appealing to the very first truth that I declared to you this morning. God's unfailing per perfection, his attributes. Moshe is appealing to God's perfect mercy, his perfect love, his perfect power. He's appealing to the perfections of God. So now look at the next verse, verse 12. Why not the Egyptians say it was with evil intentions that he led them out to slaughter them in the hills and wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent. Don't bring such disaster on your people. So now what's Moshe doing? Do you see it? Do you see what he's doing? He's appealing to God's unchanging purpose. Moshe is saying to God, you purposed to bring these people out of slavery in Egypt to show your glory. You said it yourself. You said it back, it was said back in Exodus, Shabbat 14, 18. Then the Egyptians will realize that I am Adonai, when I have won myself glory, 
at the expense of Pharaoh, his chariots, and his cavalry. God, you can't, you can't let them be destroyed. You can't let them be destroyed here in the desert when your purpose is to make a great name for yourself through them. Your purpose to show your glory has not changed. He's appealing to the purpose of God, the unchanging purpose of God, and not just his perfections and his purposes, but his promises too. Back up to 13. Remember. <laughs> Moshe's telling God to remember. Remember God. Remember Avraham, Yitzhak, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your very self. You promised them. I will make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky, and I will give all this land I have spoken about to your descendants, and they will possess it forever. And there it is. Another anthropomorphism. God doesn't need reminding by Moshe. <clears throat> Does he? Remember God? Is that the name it and claim it movement's all about? Remember God, what you said in your word? God knows what he said in his word. We're just not interpreting it correctly. Because our flesh is in the way. He knows what he says. Remember God, what you said. You can't go back in your promise. Your promises are unchanging. You can't break your covenant. And you can't break your promise. Your kids ever say to you, Dad, you promised. Right? Any, any parent here ever hear that? Yeah, you all did. <laughs> you all did. You promised. How, how do you say no to that? So Moshe calls out God on these unchanging truths. His perfections, God's purposes, God's promises. What's amazing is is this passage that elicits so much debate as to whether God changes his mind is soaked with the unchanging nature of God. So verse 14 makes it kind of tough for us after saying all that. And then we read the Lord has changed his mind. <laughs> How do we reconcile this? You know, sadly, B'nai Israel kept their disobedience going throughout most of their history. They, there were short breaks where they were behaving, where they listen and obey God. But by the time of the Babylonian exile, the prophet Yirmiyahu concluded that the covenant had been completely broken. There was nothing left. There was no point arguing for the people anymore. They were toast. And some of the prophets paint such a bleak picture for Israel that even Teshuvah or repentance wouldn't do the trick anymore. They've gone beyond the point of no return. They were finished, the prophets felt, as God's covenant people. How long can somebody push your buttons? How long in a marriage can you have the same attitude, the same behavior, the same issues, at some point the other spouse says, enough, I'm done. I'm done. I'm finished. When they don't argue with you anymore, they don't debate with you anymore, when they quit that's what happens. That's when you know when marriage is over, when they don't argue back. They just don't care. They give up. Quit. And that's where it seemed like the, the sages believed that God's people were at. That they were finished. And they pushed God's buttons too much. How long can your children disobey you or hate you before there's a break? They say that a family bond is strongest, and that might be true. But even in that, isn't there a breaking point? Just because of your family, you didn't get to choose them. They're your family. You're just born into a family. The covenant was over. One day God would write that covenant unto human hearts, but as for the covenant made with Moshe, Israel had chosen disobedience, and even though they had signed on in a full agreement. And it's no wonder that the prophets say that Israel had played the whore. She committed adultery over and over and over again. So how is it any different with our sin? How is it any different for us? With our stubborn refusal to be holy and set apart for God, how is it any different? Who will be our Moshe? 
Who will be our Avraham arguing to keep us from God's wrath? Do we forget that we've been called to obedience? My son tried to communicate that two weeks ago. A 13-year-old boy tried to communicate that very message. Do we forget that God is not only merciful, but he's also holy? How will we be spared the destruction that our sin deserves? Who will change God's mind when it comes to you and me and the lives of disobedience that we cherish so much? Uh, I want to read for you a Bible commentary. And this commentary, I think, is going to kind of tie it all together for us. All right? I want you to listen carefully. The God of Scripture can nonetheless, by his free decision, become what he is not, without ceasing to be the God that he eternally is. Because if he's God, he can choose whatever he wants. God cannot become God, but he can, in a real sense, become temporal, spatial, and historical, without ever ceasing to be God. Therefore, in becoming human, God did not cease to be God. So my words, in other words, God cannot change his nature. God can't change his nature, who he is, but he can change how he chooses to relate to us. You understand where I'm going with that? God is who he is. His perfections, his purposes, his promises, it's his nature. He can't change that. But he can choose how he wants to relate to each of us. And the commentator goes on, all revelation of God is essentially, here it is, anthropomorphic. For all revelation takes place in the form of a human. How do we know of God except through an anthropomorphic experience. The good news is we, that we certainly don't deserve. But the good news is we've heard the good news that has been proclaimed, the good news that we have come to believe is this. And I read from Eshiahu, Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. All of us have turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Here's the good news. The good news is that Yeshua, the revelation of God in human form, our Passover lamb, is the embodied repentance of God. And what do I mean by embodied repentance? God changed his mind about us, on how he's going to relate to us. The fierce no of his judgment against us and his wrath for us has in Yeshua become a resounding yes of mercy, forgiveness, acceptance, and love. In other words, Yeshua has taken the place of Abraham and Moshe and has argued on our behalf and has kept the covenant for us. When Yeshua died on the execution stake for us and for our sins, Yeshua killed our disobedience and left us new life with him in the spirit. See, God's perfect nature had already prepared for us a perfect solution. Parents, you're told to be all about follow through when you're dealing with your kids, right? You gotta follow through with that. If you're gonna say you're gonna do it, you gotta do it. Right? You make a threat. Fall Otherwise, your child will know you can get away with anything. So, how does this work with God's grace? Does God follow through? In Yeshua, God's desire for us to be holy is made complete. God sent his son so that we can be in relationship with him and that we can finally experience obedience through Yeshua. In him, we find holiness. We are made holy. We can't pretend, brothers and sisters, have this all figured out. I ain't gonna lie to you. I don't have it all figured out. We're wrestling with God. We haven't created boxes to fit God into, but we do have good news about God. We do proclaim the gospel that our God has relented and has shown us unending love and kindness through his son, our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach. 
We can be honest about our desire to put handles on God, to place God at our disposal, but we do so in confession. We repent of our idols, yes we should, and we turn to Yeshua whom God was pleased to dwell. His incarnation was for us. God chose him, how he's going to relate to us. The place we focus our attention, because as Rabbi Shaul writes in Hebrews, long ago God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets, but in those last days he has spoken to us by a son. And with that said, how do we apply all this? It's simple. The application isn't complicated. We simply praise Yeshua. We simply pray in Yeshua's name. And we simply proclaim Yeshua. It's good news. Please rise. As we bow our heads, Father, in Yeshua's name, you knew when you needed a mediator. You sent Moshe, Father, to speak on behalf of the people to you, and you spoke to Moshe on behalf of the people. And Moshe spoke on your behalf. Father, the people were delivered from Egypt. Father, we need deliverance from our own Egypt. In Yeshua's name, Father, to whom we always pray, we recognize, Lord, that he has become the mediator that you sent to us. You. You to relate to us in human form so that we find and experience the revelation of who you are in an anthropomorphic sense.